Sales Hacker community. Thanks so much for joining us for another fantastic webinar. I'm playing host today. I'm Colin Campbell, the Director of Marketing at Sales Hacker, and I am beside myself with excitement to say that I'm joined by my good friend, Dale Dupree, who you may know as the copier warrior or the leader of the Sales Rebellion. Dale, thanks for being here, man. Yeah, thanks for having me, Colin. It's an honor to be on here, and I'm excited. Are we going to find out what the Sales Rebellion is today? No, you aren't. We're not. <laughs> <laughs> you have we're to wait like everybody to... else for the launch, yes. You have to All wait. right, we're going to have to wait. But we do get some really cool exclusive stuff from Dale. So today, everybody, we're talking about uh, a framework that you can use to sell the right to pitch, how you get people interested in the first place. Dale's a master of this, and I love that he's a master of it because he's in what some people think of as like an old school industry. He cut his teeth selling copiers. And when I started at Sales Hacker, we did a survey, and I spoke to some people in real estate, in finance, in insurance, who said to me, you know, Colin, I love Sales Hacker, but... I have trouble applying some of the lessons because I'm in an old school industry. So Dale is leaving, living, breathing proof that industry doesn't matter. And what's so cool about what Dale's showing us today is that this can apply in any industry. And he's going to give us an example. We're going to walk through step-by-step step how you can use his framework to make an interesting pitch, uh, to get the right to, to have an interesting pitch in the first place with some video prospecting. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. You're excited to be here. Before we jump into all of the nice nuggets that Dale has for us, I want to handle two really quick housekeeping items. So number one is, uh, if you haven't joined us for a Sales Hacker webinar before, we record all of this. This is being recorded, and if you get interrupted or you just have to step away, do not worry. We're going to send you the recording afterwards so you can watch it at your leisure, you can share it with your team, all that good stuff. Um, the other thing is, actually right now, so at the bottom of this window, there is a Q&A box. Do me a favor, guys and gals, pop that open, and um, you're going to use that to talk to me and Dale, to ask questions, to participate, because this isn't just me and Dale talking. You all took the time out of your day to join us. You can listen to the recording later. This is your chance to actually participate. So uh, we've got people chiming in already. Give yourselves a little shout out. Everybody, um, tell us your favorite prospecting channel. Here comes the flood, Dale. <laughs> phone. Michael Powell says phone. Dan Ward says phone. Adrian likes face to face. Phone, phone, phone. LinkedIn from Caitlin. Lots of face to face people. I love it, guys. Email, phone, expos. First person Yvette said expos. Wow, good variety. Patrick Creedon likes personalized video. You're in the right place, Patrick. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, so that's really exciting. I think you guys are going to get, you know, the, the, the cool thing about, again, Dale's framework, not only does it work in any industry, it can work in all these channels too. Um, so it's a pretty flexible thing. He's going to walk us through all of the meat and potatoes of it. And uh, without any further delay, I'm going to hand it over to Dale and he's going to rock your socks. Awesome. Thanks, Colin. So first off, I want everybody to kind of take a deep breath here because this is going to be a, a lot of information, but it's supposed to be a lot of fun. And so so relax and enjoy the next 45 minutes of me talking smack about the sales industry in general. So reason, what is reason? <laughs> reason is, is a new way to, to, to sell your pitch, okay? And the idea behind that is, is that I have built a framework behind the first touch, okay? And let me give you a little background on the framework itself. When I first started in the copier industry, I was knocking on doors, I was picking up the phone and dialing people, and 99 out of 100 times, I was being told I'm not interested in some manner. And I, I kind of just got deflated in the process, getting back to my office, wondering to myself, if this is really the quality of life I want. I loved sales. I absolutely loved going out and meeting people, going out and doing cold calls, but at the end of the day, I was kind of hitting a brick wall at, at the beginning stage of the sale. And so I kept thinking to myself, there's gotta be a better way. Um, and so I kind of dissected the first touch and I dissected the pitch in general and started to think, well, look, if I walk in the door and there's five or six other copier guys in the area that are doing the same thing month after month, after week, after week, 
constantly, then how am I any different and how am I bringing any type of value or causing any kind of curiosity in the prospect to want to talk to me in the first place? You know, I have the same tie, I have the same suit, I have the same button down. It's kind of the idea. So I created this narrative for myself, which is to radically educate and share one's narrative as the short form. We're going to go over the long form of this as well too, because there's, there's an entire curriculum that I've written behind reason um, to help myself. And then also as a manager and as a VP of sales inside of the copier channel, I, I, I've used it to teach my reps as well too. So, so let's I jump into the concept. I love yeah, that you point out like you kept hearing, I'm not interested. People saying I'm not interested. I feel like if you hear that enough, it just becomes any other no. But I love that you actually took it literally. And like, you're saying, okay, like that means I haven't interested you yet. And right. like, you just like leaped into action and came up with a framework to solve that problem. I love that. And I'll give you the background on that is that I'm a super social person in my whole life. It was really easy for me to make friends. You know, I could walk up to anybody in a crowd and just introduce myself and, and get to know you very well. Um, I've always had this, had this vulnerability about me and I've always been very outgoing. And so the idea of me being able or being shut down by people yeah. was not cool to me whatsoever. I thought this is like, this is new. I don't understand this whatsoever. I've got to figure out how to piece this whole thing together. So, so inside of the reason theory, the first two letters are R and E and they stand for radically educate. The idea of this is that we want to fundamentally change the way that people are called on uh, from the very beginning of the sales call. So the radical education is a couple things. It's a first touch piece. It's printed, it's manufactured. It's also video, um, which we're going to talk about a little bit more today as well too. The idea here is that it's simple, but it's fun. It has humor and energy and a lot of curiosity. One of the big things that uh, if you get a marketing degree or you take any form of marketing classes that you'll hear inside of curriculum is that curiosity is one of the best flavors inside of what it is that you put together when you reach out uh, to folks that you're trying to pitch your product to. Curiosity is a driving factor inside of why it is that they're going to actually listen to you or call you back in the first place. Um, and so, so I have an example. Yeah, go ahead. Dude. We had a bunch of people, you know, we just asked people their favorite prospecting channels. A bunch of people said phone. Some people said face to face. Does that mean like before they call on the phone or before they have the meeting and walk in the door, they need to have some kind of like piece, an actual piece of content, whether it's digital, like a video or like a letter or something. Is that what yes. the rad radically educate? Yeah. Correct. Correct. That's the concept. The concept behind it is that if you reach out cold and you just, introduce yourself to somebody, you say your name and the company you're with, 99% of the time you hit one piece of, of their brain instead of the entire thing and that piece is the objection. Uh, and, and they're going to come at you quickly and efficiently and say, I'm not interested, this is not the right time, I already have a copier guy pending that they know your company name and they shut you down. But if you can soften that first call and that first touch with a radically educated piece that they get before, uh, it will help with that first interaction. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay, cool. Yeah. And so, and really the, the whole, my whole premise behind creating these pieces was, is again, like I said, that it was, it was really easy meeting your best friend or a kindred spirit for the first time and connecting with them. So I, I really play on the emotional uh, front. And, and also, I, I blur the line between personal and business on these things. I, I use pop culture references. So we have a lot of fun. We're going to talk about some of that in a second. But the, the idea here is that it's authenticity, Colin. That is that, that's what you're leading with, authenticity, showing the prospect that you're something different than just every other person inside of the bullpen. So, so we kind of talked about the interrupt marketing pieces a little bit, like whether or not they're manufactured or uh, their video. And, and I, these are just a couple examples of some pieces that I've put together. I'll kind of give you a brief description of a few of them and then we'll check one out. Um, I have the crumpled letter, the infamous crumpled letter, which a lot of people see in my content on LinkedIn. If they follow me are constantly asking me what the heck is that? If you're my prospect, you know exactly what it is and you've most likely met with me if you've received it at some point. Uh, it's super DIY. It's super easy. I mean, a lot of times we actually use the crumpled letter or even as I like to call it, the not so business cards, which are little four by six cards, typically have images of celebrities and myself and a copy machine on them, whether the copy machine's like on fire or we're writing it to the moon, you know, varies. But the idea is, is that it gets them curious and interested in learning a little bit more about me. And a lot of times inside of these pieces that I've put on here, we, we use QR codes. And, and so one of my, one of my, my biggest pieces being the crumpled letter 
a lot of times we'll stick a QR code in the crumpled letter. So after they're done reading the content, having their, their pattern completely interrupted for the day, because again, Colin, one of the things we have to remember is that from eight to five, everybody goes into the motion. Whether it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, there's a different motion for every day in most cases, but it's a motion and it happens consistently 12 months out of the year, <laughs> every single week. And so being able to be something that's a little bit different for these folks is important. It, it literally causes them to take a minute, whether they're busy or not, and say, I need to take a look at this and check this out. So, so putting a, a piece also that nuances the, the drop and, and also like creates an expansion inside of the drop as well too is important. So having that QR code on the drop itself, something that's fun and relatable that they'll pull yep. their phone out and take a picture of this. And Colin, if anybody is watching right now, they can totally pull their phone out right now and they can scan this QR code. So we'll give them a couple seconds here to do that. Um, but I have a question while they do that actually. So, yeah. you know, on your, with your crumpled letter, just for anybody that's not familiar, basically tell me if this is how you do it. You, you have like a, a prospecting letter that you write to your prospect, right? You, but you like pre crumple it for them. How do you like yeah. send it out? What, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. I'll give you a little bit of detail on it. Um, essentially, you, you, you put a really nice letter together. I like to, there's some visual pieces that if you want to pick my brain, send me a message on LinkedIn or something and ask me the reason for these things, um, I'll absolutely divulge, but it'll take me off into a rabbit hole if I speak about it right now. So, uh, but I put some visuals on it that, that are psychological uh, to the reader. And so they, they okay. cause it, the conversation and the whole narrative of everything to kind of go in the direction that I want it to. Um, and then inside of the content, we talk about even why the letter is crumpled. Um, and the purpose for it, but we literally put this thing together and just ball it up, right? And and then we flatten it, right? So eight and a half by 11 sheet, you flatten it, make sure that all the wrinkles are, are like permanent inside of it, and then you tri-fold it and you stuff it into an envelope. The envelopes are, typically we have a design on the envelope as well, so that when we hand it to the, to the receptionist and we say, hey, this is for Dennis, or this is for the head honcho, or this is for the big boss, um, that they look at it and they get curious too. And, and really the purpose of it is to get them to open it because you want, you want them to not throw it away before it gets there. Right. So you get them right. to open it and then they love it. And they say, dude, I've got to take this back to Tim or Nancy or Chris, whoever it is. Uh, and then the whole office is suddenly talking about you. Cause it's the only time that day they've been handed a piece of paper. That's already crumpled. Everything else has been nice and neat, nice and fresh right out of the printer. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And then when they read the content again, we explain the reason for it being crumpled and it's, it's humorous. We take them down a fun little uh, pain funnel even where it talks a little bit about the things that we solve in a humorous way, right? Like one of the bullet points that I use, I talk about when, co when copy machines, when robots and copy machines become self-aware, you know, you're going to need the copier warrior to protect you, things like hey. that. that <laughs> but we also have very serious things in there as well too that, that aren't funny. <laughs> so that they hurt a little bit. Right. You have to be a little bit business. You're mixing business and personal. It's not all just how let's have fun together. Right. Yeah. We just got a question yeah. from Adrian. If you ever, do you ever keep the uh, letter just crumpled up in a ball and give it to prospects? Have you ever tried I, that? Yeah. I, so Adrian, I've got like, I've probably got five or six ways that I deliver it. Um, one of my favorite that a few people know about and, and the prospects that I've done this to absolutely love it. And actually this is like a 10 out of 10 drop. When you do it this way, you can buy little mini trash cans, crumple that piece of paper up and stick it in a little mini trash can, we'll buy some popsicle sticks, right? I'm talking DIY central here, right? But if you want 10 appointments for 10 drops, this is how you do it. You put a little popsicle stick on it, put together a little piece of, of cardstock paper and put not trash, please read, stick that baby to it and deliver that to the receptionist. It's a home freaking run every time. They love it. I love that. That's so cool. That's so cool. So you ready to pop into this thing? Yeah, let's do it. Cool. So if anybody so uh, scan that QR code, this is what you're seeing. If you didn't scan it, this is just to show you where, you, where it takes you. Yeah, let me uh, show my audio set up here real quick. It's Monday morning in the office. The weekend is wearing off and reality is slowly but surely setting in. But let's be honest, the only thing on your mind is whether or not the copier is broken. Oh, it's everywhere. Why is this happening to me? No. 
That's amazing. That's so it. basically what you've done is they've gotten a crumpled letter. Um, maybe that letter has the QR code on it. So they come to this landing page that you had set up with a video. Correct. And so that's like two kind of unique experiences now that they've had. And this is before you pitch. You're still just meeting them or like trying yes. to pre-meet them. Yeah. Correct. Correct. So wait, and the, and the site is fun. It's mobile friendly. So because the idea is, is that we want people to interact with this immediately and so we have the QR code on this, this drop piece. Um, and, and there's many different ways to do it, Colin. There's one that we actually put together that's a four by six card with the Terminator on it. He's pointing back at you when you look at the card and it says, scan me if you want to live. It goes straight to this site. So you can put it on the crumpled letter. You can use the not so business cards. You can put it on an eight and a half by 11 of doom, as I like to call it. Um, the idea is, is that no matter what though, you're nuancing all these things. And so they get all this humor. They, they see these pop culture references that relate to them to some degree or back to your products. I use the Terminator because I'm a copier guy and technology is, is part of my stick, right? And so if you scroll down in the website too, you can schedule an appointment with me immediately. This is, we, I set this up to just kind of be kind of crappy, um, unfortunately for everybody watching, but I put a little success story in here. And usually I, I, this, the whole point of this is to speak to the prospect that's, that's, that's looking like, I don't want them to hear about how I think I'm so good at what I do. And that I, I think my products are amazing. And I want them to understand how I help other people more than anything. I want to relate to them. So, and then we, you know, we put little fun, little, <laughs> little slides at the bottom about how people are hundred percent glad that they switched. And, you know, we, we just, we have fun with this. That's the whole point yeah. of this thing. Yeah. The most important part of it, no matter what. So. So do you have a marketing team that helps you with all this? Like you said, it's DIY, right? To crumple a letter and flatten it out. How do you get all that done? Does your marketing team help with this? Yeah, I, I do. I have marketing teams that I've tagged over the years that I've aligned with, um, it, whether they're inside of the company that I was at or, or outside as well, too. I was always, I love the second opinion piece in marketing as yeah. well, too. I love to kind of go to people and say, hey, we were putting this together. What do you think? Um, because here's the thing is that, when you, when you do outreach this way, when you apply your reason, when you put a little extra effort into it, you're getting appointments. And, and so I'm not making 100 calls and talking to one person that takes an appointment with me, right? I'm, I'm, I'm only talking to 20 max because I'm setting 11 to 12 appointments at a time. All right. The reason you caught my attention a little over a year ago on LinkedIn is because um, I, I always felt like as a marketer, some of the best marketers are very good salespeople. Um, you caught my eye because I think you're a very good salesperson who's really like what differentiates you, what makes you a great salesperson is that you're also a good marketer. I feel like that line is blurring um, more and more. What do you think? I agree with you hundred percent. I, I, somebody told me at the beginning of my career, they said, are you in, or they said, you are in sales, not in marketing. <laughs> um, and that to me, that just, it didn't resonate at all in the first place, but I questioned it. I thought, well, I'm going to rebel against this because I don't like this. I think that it's dumb from, from the perspective of the marketing side and the sales side should be seamless no matter what, whether it is two teams or it's you as the salesperson. And the reason being, because if, if you don't do that and you don't create this personal brand or even just a brand in general, you can still push the corporate brand inside of doing these things you will not be different than anybody else. You'll be Walmart, you'll be Target, you'll be T-Mobile, you'll be Coca-Cola. 
All right, these big brands are kind of just, they're meaningless. It's just, it's habitual for people to go back to them kind of thing, but there's so many more outside of those that we don't think about off the top of our head because we can't break through that noise. So for me, that, that, that line needs to be blurred. It needs to be completely eradicated. And I know that there's people out there that believe in that as well too, yeah. and I'm going to continue to preach it. So, so basically we're at the step in your framework of radically educate and like it requires a few things. First, it requires some kind of content. Like it requires some kind of like pre-introduction introduction. And a lot, I think a lot of people think of that as marketing, but basically what we're saying is if you're a salesperson, you either need to go get the support to have that happen for you or just make it happen yourself, right? Correct, correct. So I have, I have some, some SDRs that are friends of mine that I, that I do a little help coaching with on the side. And essentially they came to me and said, I have no idea how I'm gonna be able to apply your framework or do the things that you do. Um, as an SDR, but I'd like to, to dive into it. And of course I was down for the challenge, right? Um, right. And we've created successful and consistent workflows for them to where they're on the phone still making their, their hundred dials a day and hitting their KPIs. They're setting more appointments than they've ever set before because we're doing it a little bit differently. They're putting a little bit more time into the process for themselves on the front end to make the rest of the, the back end and, and the day easier. And then everybody around them is going, what are you doing? How do I do it? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Cool. Okay. So what's next in the reason framework? Yeah. So I real quickly, because you touched a little bit on, on, on the video and whatnot, I just want to say like the, the, the purpose of, of the video, I mean, everybody just watched this very well put together video that I did, but I want you to understand that I've got 30 or 40 videos and they don't all look like that. A lot of times it's just me with an iPhone or my GoPro or one of my Canon DSLRs. Uh, you know, sitting on a table, taking video of me. The idea is, is that you, you just need to have some kind of introduction to your prospect. I like the thought of having something like one piece that can generically touch a hundred people, kind of like the video you just saw. But I also like the idea of quickly putting together little introduction pieces. And so I used a, a product called Filmora that actually is free and you can get on your phone as well too. And in, in 2019, which is awesome. But uh, I had to piece a lot of this stuff together as I went during the process of me playing with this outreach style. But, but it's so easy now in this day and age to put something together that your prospect feels is intentional, that they feel like you've got a, a out of your way just enough to, to impress them and to make them feel warm and fuzzy. And, but the big thing being that curiosity piece. When you get a link to a video or you see a QR code pushing back to a site where it says hit play here, 99% of people do it <laughs> because it's harmless. But at the end of the day, what it does for you is it creates synergy. And so what I like yeah. to say is that the idea here is that you've got, you're inside of a crowded sales bullpen right now at your office. You need to be the legend. You need to step out of your comfort zone. You need to be vulnerable and you need, and you need to try this stuff. Not, I mean, look, I'm, I'm an extrovert. So it's easy, but at the same time too, the messages that I send in some cases that people don't see, um, all the time, my prospects do, but but others don't. That I'll be sharing soon uh, once I launch my fun project. Is that I'm not afraid to be vulnerable. I'm not afraid to talk about the things that I struggle with. My depression, my father dying of cancer. I'm I'm okay with getting personal with people because I truly want to know whether or not you and I are going to be able to click in the first place, and whether or not I want to do yeah. business with you. And so right. we've got to start pushing toward that perspective. And and so the idea of that is 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 a inside of the reason theory. It's the attention phase. It's how do I get someone's attention in, in that 30 second commercial window? But how do I do it a little bit differently is, is the mindset and the idea. And so I like to say that this is a super unexpected and simple flow. And the idea here is that like you, you put yourself into a rhythm uh, by doing this drop, causing all this curiosity inside the office. Your, your prospect knows that at some point you'll be dialing them because you say it inside of your drop pieces. All my content tells it's intentional. It does. It's not just that I drop it and they're wondering what's next. I have right. literal steps inside of these things that say, this is what's going to happen, whether you like it or not. <laughs> but the idea here is that you're trying to essentially take away this power of no. Okay. And, and give an emotional option to people that that's the whole perspective on this. And so when you call somebody up and you get their attention in the attention phase, the idea here is that we are, we are kind of, relaying our 30 second commercial, but doing it differently than everybody else. Like I like to say inside of this piece that when I get somebody on the phone for the first time that I introduce myself, Hey, this is the copier warrior. Um, you know, the number one 
company in the world or, you know, and I, I basically start to go through these things that most people say and I stop myself and go, listen, I know you don't care about any of that. And that when most people call you, they hit you with it, right? But it's a bunch of minutia that you could care less about. And so that's why I, I wrote you that crumbled letter. And that's why I'm calling today to tell you a little bit more about the reason for my, for my dial. And so kind of transforming that. essentially that intro. So. so just changing up the dynamic a little bit. So for instance, like, and, and it sounds like you could do this with any channel, but, but for you, it sounds like direct mail and, and or the QR, the video is like that RE piece, the radically educate piece. And it sounds mm -hmm. like step two for you where you really capture their attention uh, and try to get ready for next steps for like actually making a pitch is the attention piece. And that's usually on the phone for you. 100% on the yeah, phone. On the phone, yeah. Um, and so we, I, we just have a couple of questions here. I want to dig in yeah. further. So number one, what was the name of the video editing app that you use again that's free? It's called Filmora, like film, just as it sounds, and then O-R-A. Filmora, okay. Uh, and then the second question, uh, this is from an anonymous attendee. Shout out, anonymous. What uh, up? <laughs> can you shed some light on your numbers? Like what's your click-through rate, um, conversion rate, from the, from this so far in your process how does your numbers look yeah so it depends on what you send out so things that are a little bit more passive like the crumpled letter in a white envelope it gets yep. 10 out of 50 people open that okay, okay but if you send it in a red envelope about 30 out of 50 people open that because it, it's the curiosity factor and so the idea here is that if you want people to open this stuff and interact with it you can't just throw it together and piecemeal it out and then just, you know, throw up a prayer. You have to be super intentional about these pieces. Um, so when I got this whole thing down to a, to a science, I was getting 50% open rates um, in the beginning, but toward the end of my time as an individual contributor, I was getting 90% open rates and I was setting an appointment with every single person I talked to. Wow. That's incredible. And so Whether, and, um, and now let me clarify this though in setting those appointments, because one of the things we're about to talk about um, I wasn't setting appointments to go and sell them something, right? Because they might not have needed my product at the time, but I was still setting appointments, uh, right? Convincing right, them right, right. And, and making my case that I need to come down and, and at least start to build this relationship, whether it's three years away, five years away, or indefinitely, we need to get to know each other. Uh, so we just got a question um, that I want to address. It's, what's the average size company that you sell to? And um, my, my feeling is like, since we're talking about this theory applies to any industry, I also imagine it can apply to any size company, right? So maybe that question is, I don't know. What, what do you think about that deal? Does it, does it matter what size company? No, not really. I mean, like, here, let me give you a little idea of like what it looks like in my industry is that typically the average sale is $8,500 um, for, for a copier. And that's, that's like a pretty average sale um, yeah. across your territory. So typically like 50% of the people buying in your territory are spending about eight to $10,000. I'm a $2 million club guy um, in the commercial space selling eight to $10,000 and, and single transactions. So the, the, and the idea is though that I also as a VP of sales and beforehand, um, I did decide I was going to crack into the major account space. I could care less what my title was. And I started doing this, these, these, this methodology and, and dropping these pieces off to people with 250 machines at $8,000 a piece. So, and I won those deals. Got it. That's amazing. But yeah, I don't really think it matters. <laughs> I think that <laughs> the, person, the person that's receiving uh, your touch piece and that's, that, that is being pulled into your culture and that you are trying to indoctrinate in a healthy manner, that they're yeah. a human, right? That it doesn't matter if they're responsible for $80 billion or 800,000 that they still go home and watch Netflix, whether it's on a private jet or it's in their apartment. <laughs> the, the idea though is, is that we're all, we all bleed red at the end of the day and we all have a, a soul, <laughs> like as deep as that sounds, right? I hate to start getting all super spiritual on, the, on you here talking about sales, but I truly believe that we as salespeople have, can have a much greater impact than just pushing products at the end of the day. And is that where story comes in? Is that the next step? Absolutely, dude. Story comes in in the S inside of reason. Uh, and the idea here is that once you've gotten someone's attention after the touch piece and, and they've given you permission to talk to them, 
for a couple minutes on the phone. Yeah, I got a couple minutes, no problem. We tell our tale. Mm -hmm. um, inside of this too, you know, the idea here is inside of story is that we're, we're trying to make a meaningful impact with people. Okay. We're trying to have a conversation that, that and ignites the brain, right? When we talk to somebody about our products and our services, when we sit in a company meeting on Monday and we, and we look at a boring slide deck for 25 minutes with one of our bosses, you know, our brains are shut down for the most part. We are not, we're not activated. We're not interactive. And so the idea here is that when you tell a story to somebody and you take them through the motions, right, you, you go on a whole nother level. And so I, I like to tell people that in 1984, my father founded his copier firm. And in 1984 or 85, I was born with toner running through my veins. And I, I like to talk about growing up, you know, that I had a passion for impact and creativity. And that's why I got into sales. I talk a little bit about how I was a musician and being a musician helped me to hone those passions and to sharpen them. Um, and then I, I tell people that I came up with the copier warrior through this and, and that I wanted to wield a sword to protect my clients against, against poor service, bad sales experiences, um, and most importantly, to protect integrity and values is the root of my relationships with each and every single one of them. And, and by doing this and telling this tale, I, I'm also giving you like benefit statements and, and value propositions and doing business. Yeah. But I've got your whole brain working because that's how a, the psychology of a story works. Um, and so, so the story side of it is really just expanding the relationship with your prospect and, and getting their brain working deeper and wider for you and, and for them as well so that you can start to figure out where you fit into their culture. So we've got a couple of good questions floating in here that I think maybe we have time to address right now. So um, here's a, a kind of a quick one. We talked about a drop, we talked about a phone call follow-up. Is there an email sequence that you use at any point in your prospecting? And how does it fit in if so? So like I think about, and, and everybody listening to this should think about this as well too, but I think about when I get emails I, and, and as a salesperson, it's great to get an email from somebody you've been waiting to hear from and you typically open that. But I think about like inside of my Gmail, how I have sectioned off like promotions and social stuff. And, and I think about how like I just go through there and delete everything. I don't even look at it sometimes, right? I just passively go through and delete everything. Matter of fact, sometimes I get emails from people that are pitching me and I passively go through those too and typically I delete them as well. So when it comes to email and the sequence that I've put together with email, it's pretty intense. Um, I like to stay away from it as much as possible, but, but it is important at, at some point. And a matter of fact, sometimes the prospect will email you when you do these drops, they'll say, hey, this was super creative. Right. Um, I, I don't have time, uh, but I can email you. And so, but now it, the game is on of cat and mouse, no matter what, when someone says that I want you to yeah. email you, whether or not they sent you that awesome email or not. And you're, you can't sit and go, yeah, I got one. Right. Like, because they're telling you that no, essentially by saying that, whether you want to admit it or not. So I came up with some, some, some nice ways of being able to kind of break down the wall a little bit further to get in front of them. Because the idea really is, is that, you have to get them on the phone at some point, no matter what. You've got to, yeah. you have to put yeah. the voice to the, to the face, to the name, right, is the idea. But I like to make the subject line something that, again, causes curiosity, undeniable curiosity. So I don't just say, hey, or, and I don't write people and, and ask them how things are going or, or tell them just checking in, you know. Right. How's right, our right, project right. coming along? I, everything that I do inside of email is, is nuanced to go with all this. And so when someone writes me and says, I'm too busy and I don't have time, but here are the five machines I have and here's copies of my leases, I usually write them back and say, this is awesome, but I'm gonna need you to get with me because I don't understand this. Yeah. I don't understand why you have five machines um, and I need you to go over some of the stuff on this paperwork that you sent me. I, this isn't, these aren't my leases, I have no idea what you signed up for. And so the idea for me too, inside of an email cadence is that I like to kind of push back in my emails a lot and get people to feel again, this curiosity, like, because most people respond to that email and they're like, Oh my God, hi, I am so excited that you emailed me and I'm going to sell you so much stuff. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Interrupting that pattern, <laughs> doing it just a little bit different is important. We do talk about inside of the crumpled letter and my teams have had a lot of success with this too. We talk about how we will email you. We know that you're busy and so we'll email you. But imagine sending an email to somebody and saying crumpled letter guy <laughs> instead of, you know, Dale from North American Office Solutions or the copier warrior or whatever. Right. 
says. Right, and, because, you've, because you've taken the step up front to be interesting. And you're not going to, just like you said when, earlier, when you call people and you hear not interested, the reason people don't open their emails is because they're not interested. Like there can be a step before you send the cold email, right, to get them interested right. so, that, yes. so that you actually get the open. Yeah, so we have an SDR, though, that um, essentially what he does, because he sells um, on the other side of, of the country, um, he, email is important and it works for him. We actually, here's, here's a couple tips real quick that I'll throw out. Instagram is, is great as well, too. You can see that someone has opened your message. It's on their phone. Instagram is not on a PC at all. And so you have to look at it on their phone and, and everybody's on their phone all the time, right? So I've had people tell me Facebook messaging works, but Instagram is, is the bomb diggity for sure. But the idea yeah. though with, with him when as an SDR, what we do is we actually will send the email touch and we'll have the video link inside of there. We put together something fun that still, it doesn't look trashy is the idea here, right? But yeah. but what he puts in the subject line is in all caps, he puts, I'm on my way. I mean, I'd open that up, quite frankly. I'd, that's how I created it, right? In the first place, I was like, what are, what's something that someone's going to open up here? And he puts, I'm on my way. And then in the video, as they scroll down, the video plays, he's running at full speed. The <laughs> and so again, it's, it's, it's something that, if they, as long as they open it, is the idea here, because email is still a conundrum to me. And anybody that's, that's out there saying that they know how to make email work and they're so good at it, I mean, I've hired those people. They're lying. Um, they do have good ideas. But at the end of the day, it's the same crap that everyone's doing. You're no different. And because of that, you have to come up with something audacious in order to get in front of these people. You have to push the emotional boundaries with your prospect because an email is salesy no matter what. That's how people look at emails, man. Yep. We don't send an email to our mom and, and tell her about our day, right? We send a text or we call. And so that's why I love getting cell phones. I love hitting Instagram. I love getting into someone's personal space a little bit. And if they don't want me to be there, they'll, they'll tell me. But I don't hit them with, hi, I'd like to offer you financial independence. Can you call me back? I'd love to speak with you for 30 minutes. I'm doing <laughs> okay. these touch pieces. I'm telling my story. I'm nuancing the whole process to give them an experience and make them feel like they're going on an adventure with me. Oh, I love it. Adventure. All right, so we left off at story. What's, uh, how do you, what's the next step? Where do you go from here? Yes, we did, didn't we? So we talked a little bit about this already, but I just want to drive this home, okay? The story activates the entire brain. My wife is a neuropsychometrist. She has a master's in psychology, and, and we met when we were 17 years old, and I've been in sales since I can remember, right? And so my whole entire sales career was based off of this idea that I, I would go to a, a meeting with somebody and I would write everything down. I'd be like, do you mind if I take notes? And I would literally, when I would say something to them and they'd turn their head to the left, I'd write it down. I'd write down what I said even, right? And the idea being that I would go and I would analyze these things. And I would say, what is this reaction? What does this mean? And, and slowly I started to realize that nobody, even inside of a sales call, wants to be sold to is, is kind of the bottom line. And so using stories is important. I use stories to set the narrative. I use stories to counter object, objections. So when someone says, yeah, I, I, uh, I just don't know that your product's going to work for me because of X, Y, and Z. Instead of me saying, oh, no, 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 listen, you know, I'm an expert, so listen to me for a second, right? Because I'm so smart and I know what I'm doing. Instead, I, I humble myself in the process and I become a little vulnerable and I, I object through a story. I, I answer their objection back with an objection through a story, right? And the idea is, is that I tell them about John Smith. You know, I say, you know what? You're right. Let me tell you a little bit about John Smith. When I first met him and had the same conversation that we're having right now. And I talk about the things that happened over the couple of years that he decided to go with somebody else and all the things that, again, that he perceived to be truth being myths, right? But you can't tell somebody that. I mean, again, you haven't built credibility. That, that, that is earned over time, not within 10 minutes yeah. of a meeting, right? And so you, you have to be cognizant of these things. You have to roll with the punches and you have to be pushing that emotional boundary constantly. So the next piece of, of my reason theory is the O, which is outline. I like to say that this is where the rubber meets the road. That's like some stuff my dad used to say, right? <laughs> rubber meets the road. But the idea here is that we have their attention at this point. We've, we've got this great touch piece. We've hit them with, with, an, with the attention portion of it where our 30 second commercial is, is kind of bizarre even to them. <laughs> to them. They're like, what is happening right now? That we hit them with a story pull them in emotionally, get the brain working, and then we smack them with the outline. And the idea here is that we lay out an agenda. 
we give them an option instead of a, you're trying to sell them. You know, we romanticize the future business relationship between our two firms. And right? we, we don't go for the throat in this process either. This is super important because you've done all these things in order to create synergy with, with the prospect, not to just like take a crap on it here at the end and set the appointment, ring the bell and tell everybody in the office, right? That's not, that's not the point. And really what a lot of sales reps do wrong when they set the appointment is that they ask the prospect, so, you know, can I get 15 minutes next Tuesday on your calendar? I like to make the prospect at, tell me when they want me to come in, right? So inside of the outline phase, again, like we, we put the ball in the prospect's court, essentially. You know, so uh, kind of like a little overview of it is that, you know, I like to tell people that I can sit here and spit out a bunch of generic processes and workflows that I could optimize for your business, just like based on your vertical, right? And common right, right. sense. Uh, but I'm not looking to sell you something surface level in the first place. You know, the only way for me to understand whether or not I can change the game for you is to get a little bit more intimate with you and your business. Meet the folks inside that are making this thing operational in the first place and start to apply my ideas. And look, if they don't, if, if you don't like my ideas, that's okay. Why don't we learn a little bit more about who you serve in the community and myself as well, and let's build a referral relationship. So that way, we're telling the prospect whether we meet and, and, and there's synergy and you can buy my product or not, it's going to be worth your time. Uh, both of our time, though, too, because sales is, are the grounds where mutual uh, benefits meet, right? So right, the right. idea here is that both parties have to be mutually beneficial in this perspective, from this perspective of setting an appointment and moving forward with a sale. We can't have our agenda laid out or, or have their agenda laid out even because it doesn't help us when we do that. And again, we begin starting to force ourselves into their agenda, and they don't want that in the first place. So, so the outline is like the business part of the theory, but really like at the same time, it's, again, it's this complete pattern interrupt, like no other sales rep has per pursued or relayed to the prospect to this point. Right. So, so, so at this point, like you've curiosity. used some humor probably up until this point, right? You've got yes. pop culture references and stuff. Is this the point where you start to dial that back or do, or do you leave that in there? No, we dial it back a little bit because you do. The, the biggest reason why is in any kind of conversation that you have with somebody, whether you're joking around with them for the whole thing or not, but at the end you say, Hey, it was good to see you. I love you. Have a great day. I'll talk to you later. Right. There's no humor in that. It's this emotional connection that you have at the end of a conversation in most cases. Right. Right. right you don't right. walk away from somebody and say, uh, Hey, uh, your shoes untied. Gotcha. Yeah. And then run to your car. I mean, that, you're just a jerk. Right. Nobody's. Right. Yeah. yeah, then you're the fool. Oh. <laughs> yeah. right. so, so the idea is, is that, again, because we've, we've opened the brain and the brain is working to its full capacity. And at this point, this person is super curious about what it is that we want to accomplish with them. And so we tell them, right? Because th at this point, they're going, okay, this is a copier guy. He's the craziest copier guy I've ever talked to. He's got this full on story that I kind of want to hear a little bit more about. And I also want to tell in mind now is the idea here. Like we're opening them up to being vulnerable to us and we're get they're practicing empathy in, in the process too, which is important. Right. right. So, and then, and then we hit them with the outline, which just basically is like the, the mic drop, the slit, you know, at the end of, of the conversation. Okay. Got it. So now, so now you've got an agreement on some kind of shared agenda. It's not just your agenda. It's not just theirs. This is what's next. Yeah. You know, that to drive home what you're saying right now is, you know, we're enabling them, right? Yeah. We're, again, we're putting the ball in their court and we're helping them to feel super excited to meet with us. We, we don't want to deflate the ball at the end, right? Like, uh, that was a cool call until the end when the guy was like, I need 30 minutes next Friday on your calendar. It's <laughs> right. Right. Like, right. I don't want to do that. So, so at the end of reason, we have an end and it stands for nuanced. I like to say that reason, that nuance is, is the captain of your reason, is the captain of the ship. The idea here is that throughout everything that we just talked about, it is, it's very Dale. Um, it's all the things that, that drive me. It, it's, it's a way for me to basically explain to you the prospect that this is who I am. This is what I believe. This is how I feel. This is why I think it's important that you and I talk. Um, and, and I'm doing it through the whole process. Matter of fact, the, the end the, the nuanced portion of this, it plays into inside of my theories and my curriculum, it plays into the, the first meeting. It plays into the follow-up 
it plays into the, the 12 months that you're going to be courting them before their contract expires and, and you're going to get a shot of their business. So this is kind of like the idea of nuance is really bigger than just reason is kind of the idea here, but, but it is the overall driving factor. You know, the definition of the word is characterized by subtle shades of meaning or expression. And so the idea here is that throughout the process of giving someone your reason, you're throwing shades of who you are at them and they see it. This is your personality. This is your signature, your individual touch on a, on the approach, on your purpose for contacting them on the way you approach your pitch on how you follow up all of that. Right. Correct. So we got to, this is a, I think a really good question from Stephen Chase. Thanks Stephen. Um, How would you coach an SDR into telling their story when an SDR is more or less just the middleman in starting the sales cycle with an account? What's up? What's up, Steven? That's a great question, dude. I wonder uh, who told you to ask that. It wasn't me. I promise. (laughs) Not a plant. Steven is not a plant. (laughs) So it it is a great point. Okay. So I talked yesterday. I was actually, this is great question for the conversation I was having yesterday with with a young man about how, belief in your product and your role inside of the system is so important. If the prospect doesn't hear you bringing this emotional flavor to, to the table, it doesn't hear your, your passion for what it is that you're doing inside of the system. Why would they care in the first place? So it doesn't matter if they ever talk to you again, you have to, you have to lob this thing up for the next guy to lay it in or the next girl to lay it in. And so the idea here is that it is so important to tell the story of Steven. But at the same time, too, remember that we're nuancing the process for them and as an SDR, not, net, not just nuancing us, okay? And so you have to think from, from a bigger perspective that you have a corporate brand, you have somebody else that you're about to introduce them to. And so laying the story out in a manner that basically hands it off in the first place is gold and it works every time. So you, you talk a little bit about, you know, the four keys and core principles of your story, which, you know, are part of my curriculum as well, too. But and it's a rabbit hole to get into, but you, you, you use those to kind of build the, the concept and, or to, I should say, to conceptualize your story. And when you pitch it, the idea is, is that the prospect understands that you're going to give them off to somebody else, but that they, they like what you've put together for them and the story that you've told. And, and they're okay with you handing them off to somebody else because, you're, again, you're teeing it up for this person. Now, there has to be synergy there, though. That's the problem. Yeah. Um, I think that I run into with most SDRs is the next person when they get on the phone with them, if they're just account executive and all they care about is cash in the commission check, this isn't going to work. And that's why there has to be a rebellion inside of the sales world. Yeah. I mean, the way I think about it is SDR, BDR, whatever you call it is already probably the hardest sales job, I think. And like, if you don't care deeply about your product, if you're not excited to help people, if you aren't excited to introduce the AEs that you work with, um, maybe find somewhere you can be excited. Yeah, for uh, sure. For sure. And I'll say this, uh, Colin, is that when you tell the story uh, of, of Steven, as you are passing them in the story, you're passing the prospect on to the next part of the, the, the sales cycle. You're telling them that in the story. These are inside of the outline as well, too. You're saying, so here's, here's what's going to happen with us is, you know, I'm going to give you over to Ryan or Jackie or, or Nancy, whatever it is, right? And the, the idea is, is that you've, again, you've woken this beast. Their brain is, is on full blast and they're listening. You have their attention. And so nuancing the process and making sure that you are incredibly intentional about what is next and being adventurous about that is just as important as telling your story inside of it as well. Got it. Uh, I, I have, I want to make sure we leave time for questions because we've got a couple others that I'm not throwing out there yet, but I can, Dale. What else do you want to cover here? Yeah, I, we're pretty much at the end of this thing, man. So, you know, reason okay. is to radically educate and share one's narrative. And you've, you've seen the long form of it. You know, there's a lot of detail inside of everything that we just talked about. So we're just, you know, giving the hour version of it basically. But uh, what questions does everybody have? I'd love to hear them. Yeah. So there's a lot, a lot of places to go deep here. And just to review everybody, like, you know, this is a theory. This is, this doesn't have to be applied to like, here's step-by-step what Dale does. So we're going to do it too. The idea here is like, you have to think of yourself as a marketer first and radically educate, be different, and then inject your personality, share your story. Um, You know, make sure you have their attention. Don't just start pitching right away. So those are the principles underlying. It can be applied to any industry. 
in any channel. It doesn't have to be the direct mail and then the phone call and a face-to-face -face visit with some email throughout. Um, but one of the questions we did get actually a couple times, Dale, was um, it's kind of a two-part question, So it's but it's about age and the age of your prospect. So um, do you find that older or younger prospects tend to respond better to your approach? And do you change your messaging points for those audiences depending on age? Yeah, so the younger, obviously the millennial generation, which I am a millennial in case anybody was wondering, I know I look like I'm 50 years old, but um, that's just genetics. I have bad genetics, that's all. But uh, <laughs> the younger generation loves this stuff. I, I like, let me give you a quick story to answer this question, okay? And, and this is, this is going to be two touches that I did. I'm going to tell you what happened, and then I'm going to explain to you which one was the young person and which one was the older gentleman, right? Okay. The, right. the first drop that I did, I went in, okay? I met the person at the front desk. We had a great conversation using my touch pieces. I used my not-so-business card. I'll go ahead and divulge what's on one of those. There's a picture of me with a sword, and I'm actually fighting a copy machine, and it looks like a Mortal Kombat scenario, right? So there's like a health bar and the whole nine yards, and, yeah. and they loved it. And we just had this great conversation, uh, and she said, hey, so you know, the decision maker's here. Let me go back and, and get the card to them. Um, she did. She came back and said, five minutes. Can you wait five minutes? No problem. I waited five minutes. He came out, you know, gave me a bro hug. We hung out in, in his office for probably another 30 minutes. Uh, he told me a lot, a, a ton about what they had going on, some of his ideas, you know, some places that I, he thought I could help. And, and we set up an appointment for like two months out after that. Like, hey, you know, now's not the time, but why don't we together in, in about two months? Um, and let me, let me say this too, that there was two years left on this person's lease cycle. Okay, and so oh, wow. That's why they told me this, right? So, and it, but that was a good touch, right? I mean, if 99% if yep. of salespeople could have that interaction, it would be great for them, right? And, and again, that's the, a good touch. This person, when I left, they added me on Facebook. Um, they're still on my Facebook today. I think they're actually on this webinar uh, because they're, in, they're, they're the VP of sales now for the company. So um, it's a great relationship that I built with this person. But again, like, and, and I think about those things, Colin, not to get off subject here, but I think about how every interaction is so important because we don't know what could happen between and the synergy that could happen between us and the person that we're introducing ourselves to. So it's so important to remember that do not take these things lightly. Do not take that phone call, these hundred dials lightly. It is important. It is not just important for you. It is important for the person that you're calling as well too. And so the second call front desk lady, much older. Okay. By 20 years, just about. And she, and I know that because she told me her age at one point, um, I gave her the, the touch piece. She was very kind. But she basically told me he's not available, the, the decision maker. Um, she asked me a couple of quick questions. I could tell that they were buying signals to a degree. So I thought maybe there's something going on here, but I didn't want to push it. That's just not who I am. Um, and I left the office within about five to 10 minutes, right? Much right. different call. So I get in the car, I drive down the road. And within two minutes of driving down the road, a call comes in on my cell phone and it's from her boss. And he asked me to come back. Now, this gentleman was about 30 years older than the, the decision maker I just met with. I sat in his office. He, he also had two years left on his lease. I signed him up right there before I left his office. Holy mackerel. So basically, the, idea here is, the response works, you know. It, <laughs> yeah. It doesn't it does. matter. It yeah. does. And so, like, here's the age thing, right, is that this dude was super weathered, right, and he had never been treated like this before. And he knew that if I walked out of that office and never came back, he might miss out. And so he got right. FOMO and he called me up and said, come back right now. And, and he asked me even in the, in, in, in the motions as we were talking, is it, does it make sense for me to upgrade this early? I said, it depends, right? I mean, I'm not a, I go for the throat type sales guy anyway. I laid it out to him through common sense. And again, I, I nuanced it. I told him stories about people that had upgraded early and what happened. Right. So I never, I never talk about these things that are my opinion. Right. I give factual evidence through stories always to set the narrative. Uh, and, and meanwhile, the millennial that I met with, it was my age. He, it took me probably another year to, to sell him, but both great interactions, right? Absolutely right. great interactions. But where this works the best is the people that are weathered by sales individuals that are just sick and tired of being treated like another number to them and like another sale, and like another commission check. And they're looking for this outlet, okay? 
And occasionally you will find somebody that's in the millennial generation that feels the same way because they've dealt with some bad people as well too in the, in the short time that they've been in business. But I like to put it like this too, Colin, to answer that question even further is somebody said to me, you can't text that guy. He's 50 years old, right? He's not going to, he's not going to text. Oh my God. That drives me nuts. I was like, look, did he have a picture of his kids on the desk? Oh yeah. He's got four. He texts. Trust me. None of those kids talk to him on the phone. Yeah. He and so when you text him, you're going to be one of his four kids to him. That's how he's going to look at you. Right. Emotionally, that's how he's going to respond. So as long as you're not texting him going, Hey, I'd really like to meet up with you and sell you something. Right? <laughs> you know, it's so funny how people are afraid to try new things like that. Oh man, he's not going to, he's not going to text you. Um, she's too busy to pick up her cell phone. You got to try her on the office. She's not going to pick up her cell phone. Right. What's the harm in trying? Cause you gotta have a mindset of abundance. There's going to be other prospects, other leads to follow up on, but you have to be willing to right. test things. Uh, an interesting point sales hacker actually partnered up with um, a couple different organizations a while back and we did a study and found that uh, older folks are more like older prospects are more likely to be willing to text for business. Um, yes. So it's a little counterintuitive. Um, we've got a couple rapid fire questions here too, Dale. So, um, we looked at one video, right? And you mentioned that you have several other types of videos that you send. Can you give like really quick descriptions of what those look like just so people have an idea? Yeah, sometimes I'll just do a quick shot and say like, hey, my name's Dale and I'm about to call you a hundred times. And so I just wanted to give you this video first so that you know what I look like. You can print a picture of me out of the office and put, you know, the don't pick up this guy's phone call all over the place just to make sure that I don't get through. But, you know, if you're feeling that you need a little bit of help in the technology sector, maybe we should talk, right? Like a quick 30 second video like that for people. There's times when I'll take people on the tour of the office, right? With my right. iPhone, like, hey, what's it, how's it going? I just wanted to show you a little bit of my culture. And I've got like a tech sleeping in the break room and, you know, fun stuff is the idea here. But it humanizes the process as well, too. But I never get on, on a video with someone and say, you know, hey, Jake, my name's Dale. Uh, I'm so, man. I, I just am so excited to learn more about your business, and and I see that I see that you guys manufacture these little plastic clips. Wow, that's so cool! And like, so I I sell software. And I was hoping we could get together sometime and talk more about it. Like, I'm always yeah speaking to my audience from this completely different level. Entertainment is what video is. That's what people that's are using when they see videos or they see entertainment. So. People, people use the word personalize. Um, I think relevance is better or interesting. It, there's a lot of better things to aim for, I guess, than personalization. Using someone's yeah. name at, at this point is kind of table stakes, but to, to get a little creative and get their attention takes maybe some extra time and effort. Um, okay, so that's yeah. an interesting overview of your videos. Can I, can, I, uh, can I say something to that too real quick, yeah. Colin? Like, of course. Like, yeah. Just because you know that, that your prospect went to the University of South Carolina and that they like to jet ski – and, and that they smoke cigars. I mean, that's all over their social media and all over the internet anyway. It does not mean that somehow you've built credibility and earned trust with them. And so right. just because you've personalized this touch, because you know their middle name or you, you, you know, have read something about their mom and, and mentioned it in a letter to them or an email or a video, they don't care. Who are you? That's what they want to know. Who, who are you? This strange person that knows so much about me, right? Yeah. I mean, it, right, right. it does not resonate with people, so. I love your take on that. Um, so here's another quick one. How do you get, how do you know, how do you, how do you find people's Instagram profiles like, or, or, or get cell phone numbers to start texting them even? Where do you source yes. them? Yes. So the Instagram one can be a little difficult. Uh, a lot of people don't just <laughs> literally put their name as a quick link to it. Um, and, if, and if they don't, one of, the, one of the other ways that you do it inside of going and doing these touch pieces and meeting people in the office, I'm telling you right now that I've built relationships with people before I even talk to the decision maker in some cases, and I will literally get them to help me find them on social media. And they're totally cool with it. And 99.9% .9 of the time they're like, yeah, hold on. His, his Instagram name is like, I love, you know, monkeys flying over my head. Okay. You know, like whatever. So you ask it's a gatekeeper or some other champion that you have in the sale. Yeah. But I'm telling you right now, if you, if you look, if you just get on, onto Instagram and you look, and, and understand too that a lot of times you're going to have mutual connections or maybe they're, they're in um, the, you know, cleaning supplies, right. Is their profession. And you have four customers that are also in cleaning supplies. Maybe they're connected as well too. So heading over to their pages, finding, you know, the mutual connections 
portion of it, right? Now they're not going to be in there because you're not connected, but searching into their friends lists, if their stuff's public to you because you're friends with them, you'll find them. It's, it's very easy. But again, like this is, I want to also preface this and help you to understand that like this is powerful stuff, right? Like I've been able to get on my Snapchat on my phone and be in the radius of somebody on their Snapchat in a building and add them. That's a real thing that you can do. And then I've Snapchatted them, you know, video messages, right? And they weren't always the decision maker though, right? Sometimes they're just like some person at the office. And so the idea is, is that again, like if you're doing this call right and you're, you're having fun and you're entertaining people that it doesn't matter if they make the decision because they'll write you back and go, that was hilarious. You got to talk to Joan though. Right. You know, and then you write them back and go, can you, can you hook it up? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, no problem. So. <laughs> All right. Dale, AKA copier warrior, AKA leader of the sales rebellion, which unfortunately remains a mystery to me. Um, thanks for being here, man. This has been great. You shared a lot of great detail, but also this awesome overview of how I think people can kind of change how they think about sales, how they think about prospecting, how they think about even like what they do before they start prospecting in a way um, that like pre handshake handshake. So thanks for being here, man, sharing all your wisdom. We appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me, man. It was a pleasure. It's been a joy. Everybody, thanks for joining. It's been a pleasure having you. You'll receive the recording in your email soon. Uh, so share it around, give it to everybody. And we'll see you on another sales hacker webinar soon, I hope. Take care, everybody.